<laughs> wow, that's the Death Star music. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Hi, Jillian. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Nice to see you. I'm sorry nice we're not cats you. for everyone who's I coming. Know. About that. I, I know. No I, wish we, on stream yard. <laughs> I wish we had cats on our heads, sitting on our heads. That would be great. But I've got no. a dog behind me. You do. You do. Several. <laughs> several. That's <laughs> good. So welcome, everybody. This is uh, the next episode of Global Voices Insights. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Global Voices is an international network of writers, activists, translators, and uh, we used to be called, we used to call ourselves bloggers, but since uh, <laughs> blogging died way back in 2014, we really aren't going to, we don't use that terminology anymore. And Jillian will tell us all about that. <laughs> hey, I still blog. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, but, but I don't tell anybody anymore. Yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. It's deep. It's in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> um, folks are watching today on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch, and um, we look forward to hearing from you as well in the comments section. Uh, today we're going to talk for a while, and then we'll invite some questions, and then we'll talk some more, and then we'll invite some more questions, and hopefully we'll have a lively hour. Um, Jillian has spent the uh, last four years uh, deep in book writing mode, and and uh, we're very excited to to talk about the result. It's a uh, it's it's a it's a good day. It's a good week. Um, you can again, you can pose questions to Jillian directly from the platform that you're on, and we'll be able to see it. Um, and for those of you who are watching later, uh, welcome. So, Jillian, Silicon Values. Yeah. First of all. Thank you for writing this book. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I, it's a, it's filled a huge hole in my, in in my literature in my literature needs. It's a concise and carefully argued explanation of the many ways the social media platforms are failing to manage the har the marginal and edge cases in the world, and it's. Um, I, I'm, I'm especially struck in, in your writing by the kind of, kind of your, the humility with which you approach your subject. And um, I think it's remarkable because uh, after, as you say, 10 years working on content moderation, 15 years working on freedom of expression, and you're incredibly knowledgeable about this topic. And yet um, so many of the issues that you're approaching, you, you, you want us to, you keep reminding us again and again that these are really complex issues and, and not easily solved. And that um, approaching, approaching solutions with humility is really important. And, and the, the tone of your writing is that as well. And I, I just enjoyed, I enjoyed your voice throughout, in addition to the many ideas and anecdotes that, um, that you have. So, um, so again, thank you for writing this. And I wonder if, you can, if we can start by, you, by asking you to give us a quick description of what it is that you've done. Sure. With well, thank, values. You. thank you. And yeah, I mean, honestly, the I appreciate the compliment so much because, you know, when I first got into this field um, through Global Voices um, and slightly before through the blogging community, I felt really sure of my answers. And over the years, I've become less and less sure of what the right solutions are because of the complexity of it. So just to give kind of the overview of the book, um, this book covers a number of different topics, some deeper, some less so. Um, but the real themes around it are, um, of course, the ways in which social media platforms were and continue to be used for activism. Um, it looks specifically, the first few chapters look at the Arab uprisings of 2010 through uh, 11, but kind of beyond as well, um, and into the inflection point of what I would see as, you know, kind of what happened between 2014 and 2016 with the rise of um, the Islamic State, but also the rise of right-wing extremism in the United States, Brazil, and elsewhere. Um, and then I also, you know, <laughs> just kind of veer off for a few chapters and talk about one of my pet topics, which is the censorship of sex, sexuality, nudity, and, and sexual expression, which is something that um, I think these platforms have really just truly gotten wrong over the years um, that I feel very strongly about. And then, of course, um, the last few topics are also just kind of plucked in there, but um, I look at hate speech over the past few years. I look at the rise of automation. Um, I wrote most of this book before the pandemic, but luckily was given an extra few months to kind of 
cover what automation has has meant um, during this time where we're all at home. Um, and then, of course, I leave you with a pretty open conclusion of um, the, the answers aren't going to come from me. They need to come from global voices <laughs> to, to not get too punny. <laughs> 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 Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and and you you were you were present as a witness and as a participant <clears throat> in those early years in the Arab uprisings and a lot of the ins uh, both the both the excitement but also the trepidation that many many folks many people felt around the use of technologies for activism and we have the mass media narrative that talked about that used to valorize or. Uh, speak with almost kind of um, simple, a simple excitement, almost like a deterministic mo thinking around the effects of social media and conflict. And I think, and in protest and activism and political change, and I think you do a pretty good job of demolishing that narrative um, because that we start in that, in that narrative, social media was good and now it's awful. And neither of those things are really true, right? Can, uh, yeah, so no. <laughs> I mean, they uh, never really were, right? And, yeah. and you know, I, mean, I remember one of my very first encounters, well, my first encounter in real life, maybe my second with this community was in 2008 when we had the Global Voices Summit, not the first one, but the first really big one, I think, um, in Budapest. And that yeah. was the first time I met you. It was the first time I met Sami Perhavia, um, Ala Abdul Fattah, like a lot of the key players that in both the Global Voices community, but also um, in Egypt, in Bahrain, in Syria, et cetera. Um, and so I feel really fortunate to have been in, I remember this one specific meeting during that, I think it was around the launch of the Berkman Klein Center's Arab Bloggers Report, which I was critical mm -hmm. of, um, and so were a lot of the people in the room, but yet it was still what brought those people together in that room. Yeah. Um, and I remember listening to those voices and thinking, okay, like this isn't as simple as Hillary Clinton's State Department is portraying it. It's not as simple as the media portrayed it around the 2009 Iran uprising. Um, and this is going to take a lot to unpack. And I think, you know, I mean, we're still unpacking it 10, 11, 12, 13 years ago or from later. those days. Yeah, later. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> Lost all my language during the pandemic. Sorry, I used to be, uh, I used to be good at this. <laughs> yes, fluency. Yeah. English. <laughs> English, not necessary. Nah. So one of the, I mean, w when I think about uh, your takeaway, so one of the things that's really changed in the last decade is that social media companies have really created a system that's impossible to moderate, mm -hmm. that all of its solutions are stopgap and reactive, and they punish those without power or those who are marginal to the platform's financial interests. And when I think about like all of the takeaways uh, in, in, in Silicon values, you keep coming back to this point that much of the conversation that we have about some, what's right and what's wrong about social media platforms, not, and I want to say social media platforms, not the internet in general, because right. that conversation is itself somewhat marginal, but the platforms themselves have become <clears throat> again and again, a system that is too, too large, too unwieldy, uh, to actually to actually serve the interests of citizens, of people, not necessarily just of users. And, and yet all of the responses that we see seem to be reactive or um, too late, too slow, too little. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, it, it, I, I do always like to emphasize that it does really depend on the platform. And I see them as all very, very different, even though they often get lumped together. Um, as you know, from the book, I focus a lot on Facebook because it's the biggest, um, but also because I find it to be the most problematic. And so I'm going to use it as an example here to say that what I see at Facebook doing is having built these policies um, you know, and, and Mark Zuckerberg is, I think, two years younger than me. So he built these policies at Harvard when he was in his early 20s. Um, and some of those policies that he put in from the beginning when when Facebook was intended to be a site for college students it, at, just at one university are still in place today. Um, and what that means to me is that, you know, we've let this young man put in place his version of, of, you know, values, social values around speech, around privacy. Um, and those have become so entrenched that even, 
you know, how many years are we out now? 13, 14 years out from the early days of Facebook, we still have not just those original rules, but then all of these new layers built on top of them. There's never been a full audit. There's never been a look back or a look forward to say, hey, it's 2021 now. Is this still the right way to be doing things? And instead, it feels like this group of people have just isolated and marginalized themselves into this little bubble. Um, and to be clear, you know, I, I, again, all of these companies are worthy of criticism, but Facebook in particular, their bubble is a very, very homogenous bubble. Um, not everyone is white, but almost everyone's American. Almost everyone is um, cisgender, uh, Ivy League educated. And it seems like that bubble at the top just keeps getting smaller. And so when we look at the way that the rules are changing there. Yes, there's often some vague consultations here or there. And I'm sure that Global Voices folks have been part of those. But it feels like they're often just lip service. Um, and that there's not real change coming from this alleged um, consultatory process. And as, as I think you point out in the book a couple of times, there are plenty of people inside those companies who are thoughtful and, and considerate of these issues, but they aren't the ones with the power to actually change the policies at a whole scale and at a wholesale at, yeah. level, right? Is that right? Not at Facebook. Yeah, that's right. Definitely not at Facebook. Um, so Facebook, I'm, I'm going to talk about Facebook and Twitter a little bit here because they're, they're quite different. Um, at Facebook, you've got that top bubble of people. At the bottom, you've got content moderators who are often um, not well paid, often employed by third party companies and based all around the world, but in particular in the Philippines and other parts of the global south. And in the middle there between those folks and the, the policy teams, you have what they kind of call community operations managers. And those folks are usually in Dublin. Now, they're some of the most educated, worldly, well traveled, um, multilingual people and they're, they're often in the right rooms, but they don't have the power to make the changes. And, and I talked to a few of those people from my book. What makes Twitter different is a couple things. One is that they don't really have that layer of third party content moderators, and they might have some, but a lot of that work is done in house. And they have a more diverse and thoughtful and really agile team making the rules and responding to them. And I think that's why we've seen them kind of change rapidly over the past few months and years and really get quite a few things right. I mean, I still think they make a lot of mistakes, but if you look at the way that they handled Trump and the way they talked about it, it was a lot more thoughtful, a lot more um, intuitive and a lot more um, uh, deliberative in its, in its methods. But, um, but your underlying point is that those mistakes are inevitable. Right. Yeah. Because of the structural underpinnings of yeah. the system. Yeah. And I think that when we when we put this to a centralized committee in any way, I mean, there's a reason that the U.S. has free speech traditions as it does. You can criticize them. And, and a lot of people would say that, you know, the U.S. should be more attuned to the U.N. system. But even the U.N. version of human rights allows most speech. There are very, very limited exceptions and they must pass rigid tests. Um, and so, you know, whether we want the U.S. version or we want the U.N. version, that reasonable minds can disagree. But there's a reason that we, you know, that we created these systems as we did, rather than centralized committees that make up the rules as they go, um, based often on nothing, really. And so I do think that this is ultimately a flawed system, that if you're going to leave it to these layers of people, these, you know, very human, or again, we'll come back to automation, I'm sure, but these automated systems that can't detect nuance, that can't really do anything beyond binary, um, then you're never going to have a system of, of speech moderation or expression moderation that is fair um, and that is applied in a not just evenly and consistently, but also in a way that takes un, into account power structures. So we have uh, with us today on the on the call uh, people from Italy, Ireland, France, Yay. the Czech Republic, Uganda, Bangladesh, the Philippines, all over the world, and more coming. So, which which I think is a nice a nice tie into what you just said because. Like how does how does how is it the how is it that a you know a, a U.S. Val set of values that's applied in such a wide range of countries is ever going to to function, and and what do we do about that? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I you know I'm not going to profess to have the answers, but when I think about this question, there are a couple things that come to mind. The first is, you know, I, I'm, an, I'm definitely an internationalist. I think a lot of folks here are, and so I don't like to think that 
people in, I don't know, India are less capable of nonviolence than people in the United States. But these companies definitely see it that way, right? So they've moderated much more strictly in certain countries than they have in the US because there's this idea that somehow Americans are above all that. Um, I don't know who this comes from or why it exists, but we've seen it in the way that the rules are applied. And we saw great exceptions being given to the US um, even at the same time where mistakes were being made there in content moderation. And then, you know, one of the key examples that I always come back to that's that's heavily emphasized in the book is this thing that happened in 2012 that I think a lot of people will remember, this video called The Innocence of Muslims that um, came from, it came from an, um, a Coptic Egyptian living in the United States, but at first nobody really knew where it came from. And it had been played on Egyptian television and then put out on YouTube. And the State Department tried to intervene with YouTube and say, hey, take this video down. So you had the US government saying, take this video down because it's going to make these people in these other countries get violent. Um, and it was really interesting to see the way that YouTube responded because what they actually did was instead of taking it down wholesale, they took it down just for Egypt and to, uh, uh, Libya, sorry. Um, and so their assumption, the underlying assumption there is, oh, can't trust those Egyptians and Libyans to not get violent, but you know everybody else will be okay. And the trickle down effect was that a bunch of governments were like, hey, what about us? And started demanding that the video come down. And so again, it was taken down in those countries, but it, it, was, it was left up in the US, um, again, because of this assumption that Americans are somehow different. Um, and I think that American exceptionalism is, it, 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 comes up, it comes out through a bunch of their processes, but that example still lives in my mind as one of the, the most um, uh, salient. Yeah, and that points, uh, really clearly to the fact that there's not a universally applied or universally consistent set of rules for users of these of, of different platforms. Right, right, right. And I think that, you know, these companies were given the right to curate as they see fit. And I do believe in that right. But again, I think that it needs to be applied consistently, both in terms of across different countries. And I, I know other people disagree with that. There are a lot of people who feel that the rules should differ by country. I think that they should be universalist, but they should be um, agreed upon through some kind of direct de democratic process and then applied evenly both to me and you and folks from all these different countries, but also to powerful figures such as President Trump or um, the presidents or leaders of other countries as well. I think we'll get into this uh, really interesting <laughs> and compl complicated and uh, question around whether or not political, political actors or political speech should have a different category in a little while. We do have a first question, um, which is, um, how do you compare? How do you do you compare platforms in other countries like Vacontacta and WeChat? And do you think U.S.-based social media platforms can learn and improve from alternative and similar platforms? Yeah, so that's a tricky question. I'm not <clears throat> as I'm not as familiar with Vacontacta, so I have to leave that one out because I, I I try not to to answer things that I'm going to say something completely wrong about. Um, but WeChat, I find troubling in the same way that I find Facebook. Um, the rules are obviously much stricter and the response mechanism is quite different to what gets removed and how and why. Um, and yet it is still a very centralized censorship system um, that you know seeks to, in, in, in the kind of Chinese model, harmonize the speech that happens on the platform. Um, but it's, to me, it's not all that different from Facebook. And so you know, I think that they actually kind of have learned from the Chinese system in a lot of ways by making these rules and applying them in a way that ensures not, not, I mean, I, I hate the term harmonization. And I hate the way that it's used in this context. And yet it's still kind of true because I think that Facebook is trying to make everyone happy in a very similar way to WeChat. But it's fascinating because the motives are different, you know. WeChat's yeah. doing it because of a set of dic dictates coming from the government, a set of very, you know, very clear rules that are handed down from the ministry ministries. And Facebook is responding to market signals and, and, yet, and, and government, but 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 dispersed governments, and they're yeah. not mandated, right? For the most part, they're not mandated. Yeah. Mostly, they're more. This, it's more like a nudge. It's more like a you do this, we'll do that. It's like I think you talked about this that there's a there's an unspoken or backroom channel that's occurring rather than any kind of transparent process. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, there's there's a few things that are forced, but for the most part, it is a nudge. And yet it is this nudge where, you know, you'll have certain coalitions of governments that are kind of pushing companies to do certain things. So France and Germany are often on the same page and they wield a lot of power over these platforms and they threaten them. Um, I've got folks in, in the book 
telling me straight up that France loves to threaten the companies. Um, what the threat exactly is, I'm not sure. But you know, for in the old days, the threat was often we'll block you. And Turkey still makes that threat. I feel like India is probably about to make that threat to Twitter if they haven't already. Mm. Um, and so that threat is ever present, um, whether it's we're going to block you or we're going to regulate you. Um, but nevertheless, I think that certain powerful countries, um, and not just powerful in the in the kind of geopolitical sense, but in the um, uh, market sense. Um, mm. So Turkey's a huge e-commerce market. Germany and France are obviously huge. The U.S. Um, and India, you know, more users than many countries. I think you could also say the same for Saudi Arabia and YouTube. It's still, I think, the biggest user of YouTube. And so they do, in a lot of ways, have to care about what Saudi thinks. Fascinating. And um, so here's a question for you. Uh, within uh, different kinds of large language sphere, like Arabic, we have uh, we have the fact that Saudi is the primary is 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 one of the largest users. Saudi values are actually trickling yeah. down to other more liberal, more open Arab Arabs Arabic language communities. Is that can you explain a little bit about how that works? Sure. So I know um, you talked about some <laughs> in the book. It's a fascinating section. Yeah, I love that. I love that story. I mean, I, I love it and I hate it. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, about 10, 11 years ago, I wrote this paper at the Berkman Center with Hamid Oman, uh, who's a researcher. Um, I think, I forget where he's based now, but back then he was based in the Gulf. And what we what we learned was that Microsoft Bing was um, applying its safe search to the entire Arabic speaking region, um, even though a lot of those countries weren't censoring the internet in any meaningful way. And we, it took me years to, to figure out what happened. But finally, in 2015, a Microsoft employee admitted to me that the reason was not because the government had demanded it, but because of market research. And so I, try, I finally, you know, I had to do a lot of digging for my book. And what I learned was that these companies employ market research firms that have their bases in Saudi or the UAE or sometimes Bahrain, Kuwait. Um, and so they're making decisions based on what those markets want, as opposed to, say, what the Lebanese or Tunisian market wants. Um, and to give a more recent example of that, Twitter has this really strange policy where it bans alcohol advertisements in a number of countries, which includes Russia, which really surprised me, um, but I'm not as familiar with the laws there on alcohol ads. Um, but it also includes Lebanon. And I, I was like, why would Lebanon be banned from alcohol advertising? I mean, anyone who's been to Beirut can tell that alcohol ads are everywhere. Um, and again, it turns out that it was a market research decision, not based any, not having nothing to do with what Lebanese people or the Lebanese government wants, um, but having to do with the fact that there's an assumption that the region is non-drinking. And of course, much of it is. In the Russia case, I actually know the answer to that. Russia has <laughs> periodically, Russia has periodically banned, I used to live in Russia, so as you know, <laughs> so Russia has periodically banned or attempted to restrict access to alcohol in part oh, because yeah. it is so popular alcohol you know, <laughs> Russia has a very, very serious problem with alcoholism. Yeah. And in the 1980s, uh, Russia, you know, there were actually, you know, bans on vodka sales and people made home brew and all sorts of things like that. And those kinds of waves of governmental attempts to control are, you know, happen periodically. And so that's, that's what it's tied to. All right. Case. Yeah. <laughs> Mystery solved. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So we have a couple other questions. Sure. Um, and uh, this one is, is it safe for serious, sensitive, and secret issues being shared through the, in the internet? If not, what are the best channels for those who share those kinds of information? That That's kind of information, a, like secu security yeah. type issues. Yeah. That's such a great question. Um, so, I mean, when I think about security, I, I, there's no one tool, there's no silver bullet, and there never has been, there probably never will be. When we're talking about sharing things across the internet, a lot of times we're talking about sharing them across borders or across towns or these days even from here to down the street because I can't meet my friend. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you have to think about a lot of different things, but you really, you're looking at what am I trying to protect? Who am I trying to protect it from? What's the likelihood that somebody's going to come after me? Um, and those types of questions really differ from individual to individual. So that's one part of it. The other part is that you're only as safe as the people or person or people that you're communicating with. So you could do everything right. You could use all the right tools and, you know, apply all the heaviest encryption. But if your friend has their phone unlocked, then everything that you've said is going to be exposed to whatever threat, um, uh, you know, whatever individual or, or government or 
what have you is looking at it. Um, so I would say it's not safe, but there are things you can do to be safer. There's some great resources out there. Um, I'll point to EFFs, which is surveillance self-defense. We also link out to a number of other ones. There's an app called Umbrella. There's a lot of wonderful tools um, to look at to help you find some of the best channels. And I hate to go for one tool, but I think right now Signal is kind of best of show. Um, Telegram is also popularly used, but you want to make sure that you're turning on the secret chat model. Otherwise, you're not really encrypted. Um, but yeah, there there are a number of ways you can be safer. Just no guarantee that you're going to be safe. That's great. Thanks, Jillian. I want to bring us back to the book, and I want to give you an opportunity to uh, give us a sense of the flavor of it. So I know you have a, a passage pre prepared to read, yeah. and I wonder if you could uh, give us a give us a taste of 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 the prose. Sure. Um, so this is from the, is it the second chapter. Um, yeah, second chapter of the book called um, Offline Repression is Replicated Online, um, which is actually a phrase that uh, some of my colleagues came up with a few years ago and which really um, stands true to me. So I'll just dive right in. If anyone has questions about the context, I'm happy to go there. From the beginning, many governments saw social media as a threat. It didn't just allow their country's citizens to stay in touch with friends and family. It enabled them to mobilize, to find like-minded others, and scheme with them, often behind the curtain of private groups. It emboldened people to do things under the cover of relative anonymity that they might not otherwise, like, criticize the government. As such, a number of countries decided early on to block social media platforms. Thailand was among the first, blocking YouTube in 2006. Syria's government followed, blocking Facebook in 2007, ostensibly to prevent youth from having contact with Israelis, but more likely because it would help foster civil society. Over the next few years, these countries were joined by Turkey, Tunisia, Pakistan, and Iran in enacting wholesale or partial bans. For executives at these companies, this spelled disaster. Countries like Turkey represented massive emerging markets, and the prevailing wisdom at the time was that once a site was blocked, it was rarely restored. At the same time, governments could block individual YouTube videos or Facebook pages, but more often than not, they went for the whole platform instead. For both corporate executives and certain governments, it was time for a new strategy. The internet may not be borderless, as early theorists suggested, but its borders have never matched up perfectly with those of nation states. A website that tries to prevent, say, Germans from viewing its content will find that a few slip through the cracks. For example, two French groups had sued Yahoo in 2000 to remove Nazi uniforms and memorabilia, from its popular auction site on the grounds that users in France, where such sales are illegal, could access the platform. I'm just going to skip really quickly to, to uh, end this out. So after all of that happened, enter geolocation technology, which enabled big players like music and film studios to replace technical restrictions on digital content. The resultant effect is music files that disappear when one crosses a border or Netflix uh, content that differs from one country to the next. Over time, these improved technologies made geolocation much easier, allowing platforms to customize news sites and search and video hosting sites to comply with existing copyright and licensing requirements. Eventually, social media platforms began utilizing these technologies, first to geographically segment copyrighted material from foreign markets, and later to narrow compliance with government orders. And then I go into some examples. Um, but the reason that I chose that particular passage is that I think that that's what we're about to see or are seeing with India. Um, we're seeing protests happen in India where Twitter is closing the book. Um, Twitter is refusing to comply with some of these requests saying, you know, this, these are not democratic. These are not in line with international norms. And uh, I talked to an Indian journalist this morning who was asking me, you know, and I was like, I think you know the answer better than I do. But um, he was asking me whether I thought India would move to block Twitter. And I said, you know, I don't I don't know. I mean, I don't know what would happen now if they did with all of these millions or billions of users. And I think that we're really back at this kind of similar precipice to where we were in 2011, 2012 um, of what's gonna happen next and how the companies will react. And of course, right next door. Well, you know, India, the first time, the first internet block that I'm aware of was Cargill and the Cargill war in 1999, where, the internet, where India shut down the internet for months, months at a time during that war. And, it, and and periodically shut it uh, in Kashmir, starting from the early two thousands. But um, but so India has like is like the godfather of internet blocking. You um, just proved that I got something in my book wrong. That's why I was like, no, I thought that the first block was, was um, uh, Mauritius. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I suspect there's probably earlier ones, but that was, but when the Indians were doing it, you know, in that, in those years, there wasn't really a field of study. Like people mm. knew about it if they were working on yeah. those topics, but there wasn't this kind of accept this kind of notion that um, different types of filtering or blocking was a, was a, was coming on as a practice. And there wasn't this, the analytic framing for, to, to know and to compare it to other types of blocking didn't happen, didn't exist at that time, right? The field of study didn't exist. No, and so, then I got in on the ground floor with the, yeah. that field of study in um, 2007, right. about two years after, two or three years after uh, the Open Net Initiative started doing their work. Um, mm -hmm. That was with Berkman and the Citizen Lab in Toronto and a couple other institutions. Um, but that's thanks to Thanks to Global Voices and Ethan and Solana, I, I got to work on that. Yeah. Um, so, but and of course, this week in Bur in Myanmar, the same thing is happening, right? With, uh, with, with more blocks. Everything um, old is new again. <laughs> everything old is new again. Um, but now, with this kind of increasing, increasingly granular capacity, and of course, if we're seeing this kind of granularity now. The question is, where is it, where is it leading? Like where, where I, I, I always hesitate to ask anybody to predict anything when it comes to the <laughs> internet, but you probably have a sense of the, of the direction of the technology at least, and, and as well as the policy and this kind of increasingly kind of careful segmentation of the market based on different, different speech modes. Is that, is that, is that where we're going at uh, different, different segments, different communities, different nation, national, national regulatory environments will actually have different rules. Oh yeah, for sure. And we're already seeing that. I mean, we're seeing it with Germany and the Nets DG or Network Enforcement Act law, which uh, requires companies to take down certain types of illegal speech within 24 hours. Um, it's not working out so well so far. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, Twitter looks very different from here than it does from the US because a lot of the Nazi content's just not available. Um, so, you know, you, you switch your VPN on and suddenly there's a bunch of different accounts that you couldn't see five minutes before. Um, so we are already seeing that. And I think we're gonna see a lot more regulation coming from the US, coming from the European Union, but also coming from large democracies or quasi-democracies, um, India, Brazil, Turkey, et cetera. Um, Turkey actually has also already implemented a law that is, it's like the German Network Enforcement Act, but like much, much worse. <laughs> For those of us who dream of a borderless world and mm -hmm. who still uh, still hope for uh, an open zone of um, internet uh, kind of communications of open op of of the open internet, simply uh, Tanya Lockhart has a great question. So oh, she I asks: guess. Is there a theoretical set of universal values for the internet that could come to replace industry-specific capitalist or national values? How would that work, governance-wise? Yeah, I mean, so the first thing is, I think we have to like pull all the way back and stop viewing the internet as being in a vacuum. Um, I think that a lot of the people who've, and, and for good reason, I mean, we are, we're always putting out fires in this community in the digital rights community. And so for good reason, a lot of us have been like viewing this as a game of whack-a-mole or put, again, putting out fires and going, okay, how do we fix the internet? Um, when really what we need to be fixing is society at large and our political systems. So we can't view the internet and free expression outside of capitalism, socialism, et cetera. Um, Tanya is somebody who's like, I think of as smarter than me on a lot of this stuff. So I'm intimidated by even trying to answer this question. Um, but yeah, I would say that, you know, a, a set of universal values needs to come from the people. It needs to come from a democratic deliberative process that is a conclusionary of um, not just, you know, the Westerners who are, I hate that term, but Westerners who are currently making these decisions um, and, you know, inclusive of the people of governments that are not necessarily democratic. Um, and again, I think like, I, I would like to see this extracted from the capitalist system. Um, I don't want to see these platforms nationalized. I've heard that proposal a few times and I can't even imagine as a, as a US person what that would look like. Um, but I do think that we could replace a lot of the structures that we have with governance structures that, you know, they're not going to look like the Facebook oversight board, which is kind of a ad hoc and not so great version of this. Um, but we could see some sort of accountability mechanism or process that has oversight committees to these platforms, um, either within or outside of preferably a capitalist structure. I hope that that <laughs> got even close to answering what is a really hard well, question. I have a couple of specific follow-up questions for you. Yeah. So um, if we can call, if we can think, if we think of the, I think you make this point uh, several times in the book that 
the and it's one of your takeaways that the govern the quote governance of content moderation isn't actually governance it's governance theater yeah right? it's because because it's uh, the rules can be changed anytime and it's kind of a kabuki dance and and i also it, it has this kind of theatrical and sensational component to it in that in that um it's tied to uh end goals that are not necessarily you know around convincing people that something has occurred whether or not it actually has yeah. Um, the alternative, of course, that many in our community have talked about for a long time is some kind of uh, some kind of UN or international based rule rule set that isn't based in the United States. It's not, bit, but at least it's a it's it's a it's a universal norm. Yeah. But of course, anytime we actually try to get the UN to implement something of this sort, it tends to not go very well. And I wonder <laughs> if you have any thoughts about how does one use international standards without going to the UN? Or is there a path with the, with some kind of international organization or international body that actually looks like a, a, a true governance rather than governance theater? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'd say, why not create a new one? And I think that the prelude to this book is Rebecca McKinnon's 2012 book, which, you know, obviously she's been a huge influence on my life and on my process of thinking here. Um, and so going back to her idea of the Magna Carta for the internet and what that could look like, I think, you know, we do have to update that. That was almost 10 years ago. And so a lot of things have changed since then. But I think that if we if we're looking at this as through a self-regulatory process, which right now is kind of the only real option that we have available given the, the UN system, I would say there are a few things that companies can do right this second. Um, one of those is forward consent. So the, anytime the rules change, users have to re- a, you know, re-accept them, um, ensuring that there's, so one thing that I think everybody can agree on, even if we think that the rules, you know, even if we have different ideas about hate speech or things like that, is a system of transparency that does not exist, that these companies have been promising for years and never delivering upon. Um, and a lot of this is is um, written in the Santa Clara principles on transparency and accountability for content in content moderation, which was a deliberative process and one that a lot of the companies endorsed but have not implemented. Reddit has. Uh, gotta love them. Um, and they also include something that is super, super important and has backslid during the pandemic, which is remedy. Um, this is in the Ruggie principles, which are another set of UN principles. Um, it's, you know, a core principle of the, the UN and international human rights framework. Um, but if you put this into the systems that we have now, really what we're talking about is appeals. When decisions are made, they're often wrong or, you know, er erroneous mistakes, whatever you want to call them. Um, but users often have no option to appeal. There's no customer service. And so even if we're sticking with the same frameworks we have for now, companies could apply this stuff today. You know, stop spending your money on acquisitions and massive engineering salaries and put it on these very basic concepts that civil society has been demanding for more than a decade at this point. Um, we have another question, which I will bring up, uh, which is, uh, do you consider psychological manipulation with the objective to increase conversion rates a crime? Whoa. Whoa. Contrary <sighs> to when psychological manipulation via online media posts have political objectives. I have a hard time answering this within the criminal framework. Um, so I'm going to punt on that and say that I, I can't really say whether I consider it a crime only because I haven't thought about it that way. Um, what I can say is that I absolutely think that it's manipulation. Um, I think that when it has a monetary or political objective, um, I think we do have to think of it in the same way that we think of propaganda. And I view the term propaganda outside of the, I mean, I know it's most often used to refer to governments, but I think that at this point, we can't just view state actors. Um, not only do we have, you know, major non-state actors like the Islamic State or, you know, drug cartels, uh, et cetera, et cetera, playing big roles in um, the, the manipulation processes that happen online. You've also got like paid bots that stand up for certain corporations. I was attacked by one today that clearly came from China and was probably paid. I don't know who paid them, but they were defending Signal to me in this really strange way. Um, so I think that that kind of psychological manipulation whether or not it should be criminalized, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I tend to be an abolitionist, um, so it's hard for me to think of it that way. But I do think that it's not that different um, from the kind of traditional propaganda and psychological manipulation systems that exist. I think uh, you make a really uh, another strong point that you make in the book is that 
when we treat when we think about censorship or restriction of any kind of speech and we only focus on the restriction the act of restriction without focusing on the underlying core issues that cause that restriction to become a problem in the first place we're missing a trick and and I, and I, and so I, I i keep thinking about different tools and different or different techniques or different ways that the platforms could shape the uh, spaces for expression to to make a lot of the issues that we have uh, irrelevant um, things like the ability for users to um, shape or control what kind of content they do or don't see, who are, you know, whether or not people are sharing their stories, whether or not people have the right to comment. And I wonder if you can unpack that a little bit for us. Sure. So, so let me <clears throat> talk about Reddit for just a quick second, because I think they're really fascinating as a platform. Um, I assume that there's some Reddit users out there. I'm more of a lurker myself, but I, I, I think it's a really cool and interesting platform that has a lot of healthy um, dynamics in, in addition to some really toxic ones. But what makes it that way is that the users are often in control. So when you have, you've got Reddit, the platform, but then you've got subreddits, which are topical um, uh, forums, fora. Um, and so one of the ones that I like to participate on is one that's just a bunch of different Europeans talking about what's different about their countries. And it's super healthy. It's moderated by individuals who are heavy participants in the platform. And if that um, subreddit were to go really toxic, the centralized folks at Reddit might quarantine it, which would still allow it to continue, but it wouldn't allow new people to join. And that's what happened to the, the Donald um, subreddit. So that's like one. Oh, and the upvote downvote system is also really important there because the good comments float to the top and the ones that people, again, the people dislike go to the bottom. And so that's just one example of like a really participatory framework that is a very different model from how Facebook exists, which is that the sometimes the most toxic comments are monetized and viralized. Um, so again, I mean, Reddit's not perfect; it does have its issues as well. But I think that we should be thinking about that that way. And you know, I will say that I can't talk about what they are exactly, but I have been privy to some of the conversations happening inside the big companies these days. And some of them are even some of the companies that I criticize the most are looking at new frameworks um, to make the communities that exist within them healthier. Um, is it too little too late? Maybe, but they've got people working on these problems. Um, and I do think that there is opportunity for that. And I think, you know, we should, we should see new platforms coming soon, I hope, not just gabs and parlors, um, but new platforms that, you know, are the, the kind that we want to be on. And maybe those platforms do things like ban political speech outright the way that um, knitting site Ravelry does. Um, but if we agree to that, if we say, hey, this is the kind of community I want to be a part of and agree to the rules, then I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Well, the platform that made the news yesterday, of course, is Clubhouse, yeah. um, <laughs> because we had a brief window of Chinese users taking, you know, entering and using it as a, as a, as a, a platform for, you know, nuanced and free expression until it was banned. So uh. Clubhouse is an interesting one. I've, I've, I did a little book reading there a couple weeks ago and I've participated in a couple people's conversations, but um, I found it to be a really overwhelming platform so far. And, you know, I, I joked about, it must've been three weeks ago when I joined, I joked that it was only like a week until the Nazis showed up and I, I wasn't wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take long. No, Mar it does Mar not. Mar Monroe and Adolf Hitler always show up at the end of a conversation. <laughs> It's what is it? Godwin's law? Yeah. Yeah. Godwin's law is Godwin's law is how many steps before Adolf Hitler is introduced to the into the conversation. Um so I'm gonna bring uh, a next question. On that note. I know. On that note, let's move on to another question. Because we don't really want to, you know, talk about it. No, we don't. We've talked about Nazis enough this no, year. No, no, exactly. Enough Nazi talk. Uh so this this question is from Arpan Rachman. Um should we engage cyberspace being a possible place without defined regulation, even from their own rulers, and keep each other for uh, for security data between us by out of law outside the internet? I think I think I got that question. Um, is it possible to create to create an environment without regulation from nation states? What does it look Ooh. like to imagine that and 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 to have for us to own our own data? And, yeah. um, and could we do that with the existing uh, platform structure? Do we have to create something radically new for that to be true? 
Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That is a really great question. I mean, I think, you know, the early visionaries like John Perry Barlow saw cyberspace as a place outside of nation states. Um, I, I don't know if folks are familiar with the, the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, but you should definitely go read it or listen to a recorded version of it um, because it does talk a lot about this and it got a lot wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's still a visionary idea. And I think it's really important to the formation of, of a lot of different um, um, paths of thinking. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't see cyberspace as possible um, existing outside of regulation anymore, at least not on a global scale. Um, the second part of the question, yeah, is it, I mean, you know, I do think that there's a role, even though, so I, I wrote a book chapter with um, Global Voices co-founder Ethan Zuckerman a couple years ago that I'm, I'm still not sure, I don't think either of us are sure that we got it right, but where we were kind of critical of um, the, the kind of cropping up of blockchain-based decentralized social media platforms. Um, and yet those are one of the only solutions that have been proposed so far, uh, not just blockchain-based, but also um, uh, the kind of the Fediverse, so to speak. Um, and I'm not sure I can define that without looking it up right now. Um, but th I think those are some of the potential spaces that could exist outside of regulation, but they are also, there's a huge barrier to entry. And that's, that, that's what Ethan and my criticism was mostly based on the fact that you have to be able to build your own server. You have to have a much higher skill set than your average Facebook user does have. And so I don't see those as being a realistic alternative right now, um, especially at this moment where the next billion users are coming online and are going to be picking whatever's first in the browser. And often that's going to be Facebook or Google, um, because those are, you know, the platforms that show up in Google search. Um, yeah. The other model that uh, a lot of people are talking about for the past couple of years is something like a public service internet. Uh, we see that in the Netherlands. We see it in the UK. Uh, there's an effort out of the BBC to create kind of a, a BBC equivalent internet platform. I'm not quite sure what that would look <laughs> like. And then, and then there's also an interesting co consortium in the Netherlands that's trying to build a, a kind of a, consortium of, of nonprofits and civic minded organizations that go from content to infrastructure, libraries, and so on and so forth. That of course, isn't going to get us outside of regulation. That's a different model entirely. It's a civics model. Um, but at least it would have to find rules. Are, yeah. are you seeing that in, in other places as well? Um, yeah, I mean, in fact, you know, I, it's funny, I, I'd love to talk with you about that offline sometime because EFF has been, uh, and this idea came from Cindy Cohen, our executive director, um, we've been talking about the public interest internet. And, you know, we found ourselves sort of stuck in thinking beyond the usual, the usual suspects like Wikipedia, which is definitely a public interest platform, uh, the Internet Archive, um, you know, some of the sites that I think are like my, my favorite website, whenever I get asked this question is urbanrail.net. It's an old site that and, and it is, you know, kind of a capitalist site the guy has ads and he's selling books but it it has tracked um uh subway and other transit lines uh over the world for decades now um and so yeah i mean i think that there is this model of the public interest internet but it's not funded in a consistent way and it's not a consistent model so i i don't know as much about the sites you're talking about i want to come back to that with you at some point mm -hmm. um but there is this idea of, of sites that are in the public interest and i do think that we should be furthering that concept um immediately <laughs> yeah i think i think you know when i i think back on the past couple of years with global voices and how I think there's been a there's a there was a shift in about four or five years ago, and I where I felt like we were starting to be, you know, our basic message, which has not really shifted, which is that there should be a, a space for public open conversation of you know driven by citizen voices and perspectives, and that yeah. it's actually not that complicated, though it often seems that way because it doesn't have a central it doesn't have a central narrative, it has what it has is. And a po uh, like a positive opening for people to kind of control or offer their own space, but to always make sure that it is in public, yeah, and to the extent absolutely possible, driven by safety. And over you know the now fifteen or sixteen years that we've been doing this, we've created basically a huge archive, almost like a historical record of public expression. But this idea has started to lose favor in the face of, you know, funding interests around artificial in artificial intelligence or content <laughs> moderation or misinformation projects or fact checking, all of these kind of, all of these projects that are reactive to what's happening in the commercial space, reactive to what's happening in, in social media, rather than seeking to build and build and, you know, do something creative or positive that actually exists as a trustworthy space. And as much as I love Wikipedia, and I do love Wikipedia, there shouldn't just be one, right? There should yeah. be many, there should be many projects like this. 
And I'm wondering whether we're going to start to see a turn, a shift back to recognizing that some aspects of the maintenance of public information, this type of public information are like public health, good public health project, projects, which are like, wash your hands, repeat for the rest of your life, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Like the maintenance of, civ of a civic space is, is <laughs> not necessarily the most exciting thing, but it is incredibly important. And it becomes, and it starts to make us ask us, my question then becomes, how do we turn something that start, that began as a project or something that began as a kind of a creative initiative into, into something that has some aspects of an institution? Whether yeah, as a funding or as you know, or something else like that. So yeah, go. yeah. This, this goes back to a question that you asked me a few minutes ago that I don't think I fully answered, which is like addressing problems in society at their root cause rather than going, okay, speech is the problem and slapping a bandaid on it. Um, and so you know, I mean, I like Global Voices, EFF. A lot of these groups are funded by funders who are constantly shifting their priorities based on like you know, kind of what they see is whatever they humans see as the problem or governments are telling them is the problem. Um, but they're still really reactive and reactionary rather than going, okay, you know, we need to look at this from a public health perspective or an educational perspective. Um, it's really wild to me that we all just started washing our hands for 20 seconds last year. Um, and I remember being at a conference, now I'm like airing dirty laundry and it wasn't a Global Voices conference, but I was at a conference a couple years ago where like a huge group of people at the conference got norovirus and it was because of a lack of hand washing and then they put soap they added more soap to the bathrooms and put signs up and the soap was gone within two hours mm. um and it was just really wild to me that like it took putting that sign up but i think that that's the thing is that we need to start from first principles again with the internet and like as we log on to these sites it you know, people are just thrown into them they don't know what they're getting into and then all of a sudden it's a speech problem rather than a maybe a hate problem or an educational or, you know, critical thinking problem. And so I'd like to see the funding models and the governments um, and foundations be looking at that rather than constantly going, oh, no, we have to fact check um, instead of maybe we shouldn't have taught this information in schools from the beginning. Yeah, you're so, you're <laughs> so right. The, the, the kill the messenger, the tendency to kill the messenger here is always really, really strong. It's like the governments, instead of keeping their people safe or figuring out how to how to ensure that there is some kind of unified conversation, you know, are, sim are simply seeking to censor or control. And I think, you know, of all of the many strong messages in your book, I feel like that may be the strongest one that that we have to continually look at the underlying causes and, and figure out a, a path forward. We, um, we have a couple more questions. So let me bring right. try to bring some more voices in. Um, this is from Philip. Uh, do you think we will see more sovereign internets popping up in coming years? Yes. I'm not sure from where. Um, I definitely think we will. And I think, you know, Iceland has done a lot of, um, thinking around this, the, the, um, I forget what it's, it used to be the Icelandic modern media initiative. Emmy, I think it, changed its name a little bit. Um, but there's been a lot of thought coming from some great thinkers there. Um, I think that we will see more micro nations and um, states that want to kind of carve out an, inter an internet name for themselves coming up with these concepts. But I don't know how much of a solution they are to the problems that we have, um, you know, right now. And, you know, I mean, I think you can set up a server farm everywhere, but a states change. Um, and as long as we're in this current system, you know, like you could have a government like Iceland, which is pretty progressive, um, put together a sovereign internet, and then you could have a fascist government come in and, and wipe it away. So again, I'm not sure how much of a long term solution that is. Could there be something like a sovereign internet, um, um, almost something like Estonia's uh, kind of global citizenship <laughs> approach in which a country sets up a sovereign, its own sovereign internet with a set of kind of more a universalized set of norms that are like, really are civic minded and then seeks to expand its sovereignty outside of its borders. Like, yeah. What would that look like? Yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously the U.S. <laughs> did that. So, uh, you know, maybe it's not the only one. No, I mean, I think it's possible, but I think the, the reach that it would have is the question, right? So if you, even if that internet exists, let's say it exists in, in Estonia, um, it benefits Estonians greatly. It might benefit people who can VPN into Estonia, but is it going to benefit people in Turkey where the government is going to crack down on any of that access? Is it going to benefit people who can only get through their 
you know, basic major ISP, which is restricting access to that internet. Um, and so I think the, the question is who really benefits from it um, mm -hmm. and will it benefit people in more restrictive locations? That's right. Maybe it solves one problem, but it certainly doesn't solve the larger problem, which is how people build and maintain their own rights in their own communities. Yeah, it's not yeah. to say we shouldn't do it. I just think mm -hmm. you know, there is no panacea here. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay, next question. Uh, Global South countries seem to be hit twice by American exceptionalism dynamics and a lack of knowledge of local context. Yep. What can companies do to, to improve content moderation outside of the US and Europe? Yeah, that's absolutely true. And it's so frustrating. And I imagine so much more frustrating for the folks who are actually living in these countries. Um, you know, I mean, I experienced it when I lived in Morocco. That's where, that was where my first experience with internet censorship was, um, just from the government, not from the companies yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, so to answer this, I mean, I think that there's a couple of things that companies can do right this second to improve this, this dynamic. The first is hire locals. Um, and that's not to say change your policies in every local context, but you need to have local people who can understand the language. Um, you need to have more language coverage in the first place. It baffles me that when you look at, so first Facebook's available in like some hundred some odd languages. Um, you, can, you can get it in French, uh, France, French and Canadian French, but like good luck if Luganda is the language you speak because there's no one there who speaks it and you can't access it in that language. Um, so that's something that they can do immediately is like stop focusing on the West and start putting the money towards, you know, just basic things like language understanding, nuanced content moderation that um, takes into account, you know, the local meaning of a word rather than trying to slap a filter on it. Um, and we've seen this happen in a number of places where, you know, a word that has a double meaning, um, I'll use an English word just so that I'm, I'm clear on what I mean, but like the word dyke, which is often a slur toward lesbians, but can also be a thing that exists in a waterway um, or a reclaimed word that lesbians use to refer to themselves. You slap a filter on that and all of it's gone rather than just the negative uses of it. Um, and so imagine that, but then imagine that in another language that the company has a lot less understanding of. And that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with right now. So yeah, put more locals on it put more nuanced moderation on it and stop using automation to try to solve these problems because it's never going to work. Mm -hmm. Global Voices has a project we've been running for the past uh, almost two years now called the Civic Media Observatory that does kind of deep dive analysis of subtextual and contextual la la language in an attempt to kind of uh, explain all the nuances. And one of the things after we've done about 10 or 12 projects in the last year and a half, and it takes a lot of work to even, you know, even if you are knowledgeable and local and, and skilled in the local context to unpack meaning. And I, and I feel like even that approach uh, is reacting to things rather than setting frames. And um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we have to figure out how to create policies that actually forestall a lot of the worst aspects of it. Um, and of course, that's not easy. No, it's not. I, I remember um, one of the, the posts from Global Voices that I cite in the book was one about, I'm not going to use the word because I, I, I know that it is a slur in addition to having a number of other meanings, but it was a Burmese word that can be used as a slur against the Rohingya, but can also mean split pea soup or something like mm -hmm. that. And I was thinking like, like, that's a perfect example of why you can't put automation on this problem, why you need a local to figure it out, but then also how like you're, if you use that in kind of a double entendre meaning or something like that, then what is the content moderator even supposed to do? And then add on to that, the fact that they're supposed to make that decision in like a half second and you're, you know, you're faced with an impossible problem. Yeah, especially anything approaching scale, anything yeah. approaching scale, it's completely impossible. Um, we are coming up close to the hour, so I'm going to ask. Um, uh, let's let's take one more question, and right. then uh, and this is from Misty Yang. Given the scale, speed, and concretization of the internet, how quickly can speech how quickly speech can silo a community such as white supremacists? Do you think the same offline free speech standards can work online? Hmm. Yes and no. So I would like to see the same universalist ideals work online. And that is to say that we create a system that puts a universal set of rules in place, whether it's, you know, and, and it, for me, it would be Article 19. Um, so there would be some limitations around certain types of violent speech. But again, there would still be pretty strict tests applied to what could be restricted. So I'm not I'm not an absolutist. I, I'm not really necessarily in agreement with the American idea of this, although I understand why the American idea um, is 
used often and is important because again, these decisions about what is hate speech are really difficult to make. Um, but then to get more into that question, um, I think that the standards for speech can can work online, but we can't just have, I mean, I don't think a big just free for all works. I think that you have to think about things like um, algorithmic amplification. Again, like if we're, if we're um, incentivizing some of the worst speech to rise to the top, then we're not just talking about offline free speech standards, because that would be like, um, you know, incentivizing people to go stand out in the square and yell the worst things rather than saying, okay, like, you know, we have we have the field over here, we've got the speaker's corner over here, etc. Um, and to use a different example, you know, I think when we think about offline propaganda, we wouldn't just let like, I don't want to use Russia, but I'm going to, we wouldn't just let Russia like poster all over Washington, D.C., um, I don't think, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't say that that's free speech because it would be a state coming in and putting all of these, you know, like throwing propaganda everywhere. We'd say, okay, this is like, we have rules against this for a reason. Um, and those rules often aren't applied on the internet. And so I think that, you know, right now it's not even the same free speech rules that are being used online. Um, but I, so I realize that's a complex question and a complex answer. Um, but again, I think we have to look at these things piece by piece and look at what the, the, monetary incentives are that exist online that don't exist offline. So we have a, uh, I'm going to actually break my own rule and, and use <laughs> one last question as, as, a, as, a, sure. as an opportunity to ask you to wrap up. So Juliana asks, do you still believe a uni that universal values <gasps> in the internet can work in the future? Where does, where, you know, since we're starting, we have like Silicon Valley, we have universal values, which are a stand in for Silicon Valley in some ways. Where are we going, and 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 what are you interested in? Where are you going to take us next with your yeah. oh. after a so, long nap? <laughs> after a long, long nap, yeah. Um, do I still believe? I'm not sure. Do I want to believe? Yes, I do want to believe that. I'm still an optimist, um, and I still do think that you know I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm an internationalist, and I guess I am kind of a universalist. I'm not a big fan of. Um, um, God, I can't even think of the term right now. What is the term I'm looking for, Ivan? Read my mind. Uh, uh, particular, uh, particular <laughs> list? <laughs> no, <not> exactly. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, cultural relativist. Oh, yeah, there you go. Relativist. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yes. Um, not, not, not big on that. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I would like to see a universal values exist. I'm not sure that it will or can. Um, but I do think, again, like, we should be thinking about a diversity of platforms. We should be thinking about ensuring accountability measures on the existing platforms that we have. And I think we can get close to that, but I also think that we have to take a step back from the internet and speech and look at this from a societal level. And we need to be fixing our societies from the ground up rather than just slapping a bandaid on every problem that comes up as a speech problem online. That's super, <laughs> that's so good. No, it's so good. It's so right. Like, like, the the problem the, the way to fix speech is not is not just about fixing speech it's about fixing societies and fixing our governance and fixing everything and because they're completely intertwined and interconnected yep thank you so much jillian this has been fabulous um uh, I really, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, Thank and you. I, and I really I, enjoyed knowing so many of my old friends are there watching. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, everybody, everybody is very excited to read your book when it comes out March twenty third as the date. March twenty third. So it's you can you can pre-order Silicon Val uh, Silicon Values using the link on Global Voices homepage, or you can also find out more information about it on Jillian's personal site. And um, while you're on Global Voices, stick around, read our coverage of uh, world events and topics, and uh, consider signing up to our newsletter as well. Um, or follow us on Twitter and Facebook or any of the other social platforms that exist in the commercial world. Which we all have to we all have to participate in whether or not we we want to in some way because at the moment they are they are the ones setting the framework for for international conversations. Oh, and we have one final question. Jillian, what should, what else should we read? That's a yeah, great yeah. I, so my blog, <clears throat> my blog, I still have a blog. Um, it's got a great list of books that are coming out or just came out. But obviously the book to read right now is Ethan Zuckerman's book, um, which I, the title is 
blanking me right now. Mistrust. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So my top blog post right now lists about six or seven books um, related to tech that, and some a little bit more related to society. Um, I'm trying to pull it up right now that you should read. But yeah, start with Ethan's um, and then go on to Kate Crawford's new book, Kate Darling's new book, um, another a collection called The Future Starts Now, another collection called Your Computer is on Fire, and The Disordered Cosmos. Those are my, that's my list of reads right now. Oh, and the new book on Facebook coming out too um, in a few months. Okay. It's <laughs> yeah, a lot. It's a lot. All right. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's wonderful. More books is better. Yes. Um, so once again, thank you so much, Jillian. Uh, Jillian, Jillian to York's new book, Silicon Values, longtime friend, family member of Global Voices. And uh, I've just, I've read it. You should too. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you.